everyone, it's Rhea here, and I have with me Ivo again. And today we're going to talk about procrastinating for use to code because it looks very different than procrastinating in the general sense. So I guess the first thing is what does procrastination look like? Um, well, you got their typical ways, right? It's watching TV, watching YouTube, all those different types of things. But for use to code, sometimes people think that they're doing stuff that are productive for coding, but they're actually procrastinating. So yeah, I guess Ivo, what are your thoughts on those? different things, what they look like, how they affect people? Yeah, I think um, some very specific ones in mind would be like becoming a Code Forces rating historian uh, or a USCO historian, where you're kind of like going to the past contests and be seeing who did really well and who the past like finalists were and stuff like that. Or maybe even looking at like IOI results and be like, wow, uh, Gnadi is insane. He like won uh, seven or something like that. And all that information um, is, I mean, quite interesting, but at the end of the day, not very useful for trying to pass use code. Um, yeah. yeah, I've even seen like on the Discord servers, there's a function that they've coded in. So you can just pull up all of someone's history stuff. And like, again, it's qu quite interesting, but it's not use code related. If, if you do that, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, I'm saying you should count it as fun time instead of coding time. Like you shouldn't count that as part of your coding preparation. Uh, one more thing I see people do all the time is that they just spend a bunch of time reading different code forces blogs and they think that this counts in their code forces preparation. And so let me just share my screen here real quick. Some blogs sure might be useful, but others are not necessarily useful, right? Like if we look at this one, um, tutorial, that's probably not gonna show up on a useful contest. And if it does, it's so rare that like go back to our last video from last week, it's not useful in learning. Um, I have used Code Forces blogs to learn topics. However, I first decide I want to learn this topic, and then I Google it and read from the Code Forces blog. I don't just go down the list and start reading Code Forces tutorials. Uh, is that kind of similar to what you do too? Yeah, and just to add on to that, but I would actually also say in general that Code Forces blogs might not be the best starting point for learning algorithm either. Um, in my opinion, generally a good YouTube video where they illustrate each step uh, with an example very visually uh, could be a much better way to get started. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, all right, let's go through all these. And then they have this contest. Contest blogs are just, they just exist. They don't really spend people's time. Uh, a story about a certain interactive problem. I'm sure this is a very interesting story. I have no doubt about that. That being said, I'm not going to count reading this story into my preparation time. How not to use macros. Also going to be interesting. I don't know how useful this will be for contests too. Um, imitation, let's grow. Again, like I, there might be interesting stuff on the interesting comments or whatnot. It's not Yusuko preparation. And you think, oh yeah, I'm on code first and stuff on code first preparing for Yusuko. Um, there's like other blogs people have like, oh, how to go from 1800 to 2100 rating, different blogs like that. Again, they're interesting to read and fun to read and everything, but you shouldn't count them as your as your coding time. You should count them as your entertainment time. Like, oh yeah, I'm watching Netflix. That's fine to do, but I'm not counting Netflix as my coding time. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So yeah, looking procrastinating for use of code is looks very different than procrastinating in general because you think that you're making progress, but if you're not coding, you're not solving problems. You're really not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe next, let's talk a little bit about uh, what are the the causes for procrastination. Yeah, for sure. Who do you think the top causes are? Uh, I think a big one might just be that they're not that interested in coding in general. Yeah, I said this is definitely a cause that you see sometimes, but this is usually not the main one. Like at least from my experience, yeah, there's coders in bronze division whose parents are like pushing them and they wanna make silver, but from silver and on, it usually seems like it's the kid who's motivated and they really do wanna do coding. Um, for example, most of the students that reach out to me, if they're in silver or higher, it's a student reaching out. If they're in bronze, it's usually the parent reaching out. Like not 100% for you, but like 90% of the time. Um, and so it, you can kind of tell from that if this is the parent interested or if it's an interest. I feel like most students in silver or higher are pretty interested. Um, I'd say the big one that like people run into is that they procrastinate because they don't really know how to study for use to code. 
like they try a preparation strategy, they don't really see results, so they're not really sure what to do next, and they just procrastinate. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, I guess maybe let's go into a little bit about what should people do if they feel like they don't know what to do next. So yeah, let's say someone um, is spending a lot of time um, Googling or just browsing through like Quora, Discord, or Code Forces uh, to look for a good or, or, or potentially even like optimal preparation strategy. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I guess the first thing is like Googling through Quora, looking on Discord Code Forces for an optimal preparation strategy. That falls into our category of what procrastinating looks like. Just right. looking for a strategy. And the thing to realize is you're not going to find an optimal strategy. The best thing you can do is get an idea of one way you should start studying and just go for it and run with it. And yeah, you might run into issues. You might realize like, oh, I'm always getting stuck on graph problems. I'm getting stuck on DP problems. I'm always stuck on this type of problems. And then you can work on that and iterate and improve from there. But you want to start by doing something. And that something is not Googling. Googling is not coding. Let's be very clear about that. Googling is, is not uh, coding. If you're stuck on a problem, they have solutions and you can look up. I guess you can like talk to people then and count that as coding time, but yeah, Googling is not coding. So if you don't wait for the ultimate strategy, you just start somewhere and, and optimize. Um, yeah, what do you think the main reason that sometimes people start a strategy, but they don't really see results from their strategy is? Yeah, okay. So one thing is maybe they just haven't stuck with it long enough. Right. So I think maybe a good um, guideline is to stick with a strategy for maybe 20 problems and then evaluate, okay, is this strategy working for me or not? Uh, another thing for why people feel like they don't see results is kind of like how they're tracking results. So one example might be if you just look at your useful results and then judge purely based off of that, am I improving or not? That might not be the best me metric since USCO is uh, consistently getting harder, or maybe the problems that showed up in the previous contest, um, you're just not as good at. Also with USCO, I want to add that like, in order to solve a problem, like say they're at this difficulty, right? And you can be here. I'll say you got better, you came up here. You're still, you're still going to get this problem, right? You can get better and better, but until you like cross the threshold, you're not going to get the problem and see the results. So simply looking at that one score to track your progress, is a little bit flawed. And they do have partial credit and everything. Um, but again, it fluctuates from contest to contest. And so, yeah, you don't wanna just look at your USICO score to track your, uh, track your progress. Another thing I would say is that when people don't see results in the preparation, let's say that they're actually not improving, right? Let's talk about the causes when they actually not improve. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you have people who solve just randomly picked problems, right? And they can be too hard or too easy. Or they could be like, if there's a range of problems, let's say of your 50 problems, you know, like 20% or like, say 35% are too easy, 35% are too hard, and then got like a few in the middle left. Um, so you want to make sure, like if you're spending time on too easy problems, you're wasting your time, right? Mm -hmm. Any problem that you get by yourself in like 20 minutes is just too easy. Like you would have gotten that in contest that fast too. And any problem that's so hard that even after reading the solution, you're still stuck on all parts of it is too hard and you're not learning that much from it. You want to make sure you're practicing on those sweet spot problems and finding those uh, sweet spot problems and working on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and going back slightly to, I guess, what we discussed last week, it's about uh, improving your problem solving skills, right? So as you're doing your contest preparation, make sure that when you're working on the problems, you're actually seeing uh, progress being made in your problem solving skills by getting more observations each time. Yeah, and I want to tag on to that too. And I'm just going to throw this out there. If you solve a hundred problems at your level, hundred, that's a lot of problems, right? Um, considering each problem takes over an hour, maybe sometimes even two, three hours. Solve a hundred problems. And your definition of solve is you read the problem, you get stuck, you read the solution, then you code it up and that's it. You will gain zero knowledge for those hundred problems. I mean, it's knowledge, but you'll gain zero score. You will you will not have progress. Regardless of what your strategy is, if all you're doing is just reading the problems, the solution, and coding it up, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to make sure you learn problem solving skills. If I ask you after a problem, what did you learn from this problem? You should be able to tell me something that you're going to do differently next time. If you don't have that, if you're not consciously thinking about that, then you're not preparing as much as you, as much as you could be. And then it could be like, you're just not making progress and then you procrastinate and just watch blogs. Right. That makes sense. Because if you just see the solution to that problem, you're kind of just memorizing problems and solutions. 
And the issue with that is you're never going to see that problem again on Usico because they're always picking different problems with different twists. Yeah, the strategy might have worked like several years ago for Usico, but definitely not going to not going to work now. Um, all right. So what are your top ways of, of tracking progress? The person can actually see if they've gotten better or not. Right. So one thing um, is to have a good mental uh, spreadsheet of your topic mastery. So let's say you're in silver. There might be three or four main algorithms or data structures. Uh, you can kind of track for each one what's your comfort, comfort level with it, right? So you probably start with, I have no clue what this algorithm is. And then you can eventually move on to, I understand how it works. Then I can implement it on my own without too much trouble. Then it's like, I get pretty comfortable solving problems with it. And then eventually you want to move into the realm of, I have quite advanced knowledge of the algorithm and I'm very capable of uh, dealing with all the twists that you go might throw at. Yeah, for sure. And there's also code forces ratings in terms of problems. Um, although I will caution you, if you're getting better at Usico, your code forces rating may stay stagnant. And mm -hmm. that's perfectly okay because Usico and code forces are different types of problems, right? Usico are a lot longer problems, code forces are shorter, more mathy, more weird stuff there. Usico is adding in some math, but they're still a lot shorter. They're very different types of problems. So code forces rating is one way. The main way that I used when I was preparing for Usico and I use for my students now is I look at the difficulty of the Usico problem solved. So in a Usico contest, you can look at the results of people who advanced, right? And for every problem, you can see, okay, this problem has the most number of solves, and the second most, this one has very few. So you know the hardest, medium, and the easiest problem. So if you're able to go from saying, just get the easiest problem from a contest, and oh, now you can get the medium one. That's pretty good, you got, you got better. Um, I know the more recent ones aren't releasing the bronze and silver results, but this definitely works for the older contest. And you can also get an idea of which problems are easier or harder based on like the discussions that people have um, on different websites about the problems. Cool, now we, we told people like, hey, stick with the preparation method for at least 20 problems. You should see results. If you're not, the terrible method, you should move on, tell them how to track it. What are some sample preparation methods that you might have? Yeah, so let's maybe start with one that you can do on code forces. Uh, so in code forces, since you can sort by rating, um, start by picking a rating that you can solve at around like 25% success rate, and then just keep on solving those problems um, until you can get to roughly 75% and then move on to the next rating. So maybe add 100 to 200 points in the difficulty uh, range. Mm -hmm. And yeah, 200 points is a good number to add. If you're a little more cautious and a little scared to do that, you can add 100, but it's again, it's up to you. Um, and as you said earlier, code is not a perfect representation of use to code. The two kind of go hand in hand, but not perfectly. So you also want to be solving useful problems for preparing for use to code. Um, so you can do a similar thing there, right? However, it's going to be a little harder on use to code to find the easier, medium, and hard problems just because it might be difficult to rate the difficulty between two problems in different contests. Um, you can tell for every contest, the easy, medium, and hard one, but you can't really compare problems across contests. But that being said, even if you can just do first, like the first easy problem for all the contests and then move on to harder and harder difficulties. Yeah, and just another thing to remember is it doesn't really matter that much what types of problems you're doing since uh, the core skill you're trying to work on is problem solving, which remains the same regardless of the contest. Yeah, for sure. And again, go back and watch our last video if you haven't. I'll link it in the description. Learning topics here and there is not the most important thing. You want to make sure you're focusing on uh, problem solving skills. Um, cool. So that's all we have for you today. Now, watching this video is an example of a procrastination method. Again, super entertaining, super glad you checked it out, but go and actually code and actually solve problems now. See you in the next video. Bye. Good luck.